Our next speaker is Debbie Goodwin. She is from DBZ Consultancy from Hamilton, New Zealand. So her and her colleagues win the prize for flying the furthest to spend time with us today. And so we want to welcome her as she shares with us some of the process evaluation frameworks that the Maori people are using in New Zealand. So welcome, Debbie. Ko te mea tūata, hei he honore, he karore ki te atua, he mangarongo ki te whenua, he whakaaro pai ki ngā tangata katoa. Ko te mea tūarua ki ngā mate ki tū o te arae, haere, haere, haere. Ki ngā tangata whenua o tēnei rohe, ko Shakopi Merawakatan Sioux Community, tēnā koutou. E rau rangatira mā o ngā haue whā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, ko tūhoe tū tōku iwi, ko, whakato, ko whakatohea ōku iwi. I'm from Tūhoe and Whakatohea tribes, um, from the Māori tribes of New Zealand, two of the Māori tribes in New Zealand. Um, ki te taha o tōku pāpa, ko tai arahe te maunga, ko o hene matero te awa, ko te rewarewa te marae. Ki te taha o tōku kuia, ko hiwarau te maunga, ko ohiwa te, te moana, ko roimata, te marae, ki te taha o tōku whaia, ko Pākehā ahau, ko Ingarangi, te iwi. On my father's side, I am... I thought I'd clicked that over. On my father's side, I'm from the Tūhoi tribe. Uh, on my grandmother's side, I'm connected to Te Whakatohea tribe. And on my mother's side, I'm connected to several generations of English ancestors, who settled in New Zealand since the 1850s. <clears throat> as Māori, our whakapapa, where we come from, defines us as a people and connects us to our whenua, our significant places, our mountains, rivers, harbours and marae, which hold the history of where, we, where and how our ancestors lived and where, where our parents grew up. We recognise our diverse experiences, realities and identities as Māori in contemporary society, but there is also an aspiration to have a strong connection to our kāingatūpū, our homeland. Today in my greeting in Māori, I have also acknowledged God, peace to our lands and all people. I would also like to acknowledge the people of this land here that we stand on, the Shakopi Merawakantan Sioux community. I acknowledge those who have passed on beyond the curtain, um, some who have, we, we have lost this week, I have heard and I myself have as well. Um, and for those of us who are here today from the Four Winds, that's from everywhere else. I would especially like to thank and acknowledge at this time um, my panel colleagues, Professor Warren and Sharon Kairualani Odom, and especially Mindy Kurza the Planning Committee Chair for inviting me to present. I'm here with my husband. I brought my husband for the trip. Um, I also am here with one of my PhD supervisors. Um, if you've read my profile, you may have seen that I am a PhD student. Um, but I have worked in the evaluation field for the last 10 years, and I've come back to academia, so it's been a bit of a shock. But I'm really pleased to be here, and um, it is one of my passions to be talking and learning about our kaupapa Māori um, frameworks and our, our kaupapa Māori um, methodologies, and that's one of my main topics for my PhD. So I'm really pleased to be, to be here today uh, talking about how kaupapa Māori indigenous frameworks might help us to evaluate co-design processes. Uh, this is particularly for use within a Māori University research partnership and from an Indigenous perspective. What I hope to achieve today is to share and spark ideas to further the field of Indigenous evaluation of co-design. I'm sorry I have all these notes that I'm going to be reading. Um, I'm, I'm not as familiar with just standing and speaking um, like most of the other people today, but please bear with me. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, there's a burgeoning interest in use of co-design in developing interventions and programs and improving and innovating services, particularly in the government and health sectors. And there are many kaupapa Māori frameworks being used in research and evaluation, but we don't really know how we can apply these to the co-design context. While thinking about this issue, my thoughts went to two whakatauki, 
or proverbs which are up here on the slide. These are from, from Te Ao Māori, our, our Māori world and, and our Māori language, um, and they may shed, that I think may shed light on these processes. The first is a well-known whakatauki or proverb, Nā ku te rauru, no te rauru, ka ora te iwi. With your basket and my basket, the people will live. This proverb speaks to the importance of everyone contributing their talents, gifts, knowledge and resources to ensure the well-being of our people. At first glance, this is a great metaphor for how we work in co-design. For example, in the, in the project that Lisa Te Moringa will share more on tomorrow, the Ola Ora M Health Programme, of which I'm lucky to be working alongside as one of the PhD candidates. In this context, the whakatauki could be referring to how both indigenous communities and university researchers work together with their various knowledge baskets, talents and experiences to culminate in a product that will work to the better, to better the health of indigenous people. The second whakatauki, or proverb, lends itself to a deeper consideration. Ko koe ki tēnā, ko hau ki tēnā kiwai, kiwai o te kete. You at this handle and I at this handle of the basket. In the, basket uh, in the past, baskets were often used for collecting seafood from the moana, from the sea, like pippies and cockles. I think cockles you call clams here. Um, as a child, I often collected pippies and cockles from the harbour and absolutely loved eating them as well. Now, everyone who knows that when two people are carrying a basket, it can either lighten the load or it can cause a spill. It all depends on whether the people are going in the same direction. This proverb makes us think in a different way about co-design, and it also helps us reflect on the principle of partnership in recognising the Treaty of Waitangi, a treaty signed between the English Crown and the chiefs of the tribes of Aotearoa New Zealand. So this whakatauki reflects two partners working together. I touch on co-design here to provide some context. Um, co-design originates from the field of participatory design, sometimes called human-centred design, co-creation, lots of words, lots of different, um, it's called many things. A key principle of participatory design is to ensure that key stakeholders have active involvement and participation as experts of their own ways of living and working, and as valuable partners in the design process. And while participatory approaches are not new to research, it differs from other fields in that it, is, it uses generative tools to create, make, and prototype ideas that lead to innovative programs. Evaluation of co-design within health development projects with Indigenous peoples is also a fairly new area of research activity, and the benefits for Indigenous groups are less well known. A number of issues have been identified, such as the difficulty of engaging participants or users in the co-design process, the fact that it can be very time-consuming, and the difficulty of evaluating complex social interventions. One of the challenges identified, and I believe is particularly significant for Indigenous peoples, is the balance of power and the ideal of equal partnership between the researchers or designers and the users. Partnering Partnering relations are often viewed on a continuum, such as in the ladders of participation um, models, which you may or may have seen, I'm sure, um, which tend to go from non-participation at the bottom rung, things like manipulation and tokenism, through to um, more participatory elements, such as consultation, initiation, and shared decision-making or even control, citizen control, in, in one aspect. Herein lies the need to further understand co-design, not only as a participation method, but as a partnering method and how those partnerships play out. In other words, returning to my metaphor of collecting cockles in the kete, how do the two people collect and carry the cockles home? This brings us to look into kaupapa Māori frameworks and what they might offer to this context of co-design. As a background, Kaupapa Māori theory provides a unique contribution to interventions and evaluations concerning and involving Māori. 
the rights and obligations of Te Tiriti o Waitangi or the Treaty of Waitangi signed by the tribes of New Zealand and the English Crown frames kaupapa Māori research and evaluation. Kaupapa Māori evaluation therefore takes a critical perspective of colonisation and its impacts and seeks to promote Māori development and transformation. Kaupapa Māori research and evaluation is undertaken by Māori, for Māori and with Māori. It seeks to represent Māori as Māori. Māori literally means normal, that is the literal word of Māori. Um, taking for granted the, the validity, validity and legitimacy of our epistemologies, our language and culture. Evaluation is therefore controlled and owned by Māori, meets Māori needs and aspirations, and is drawn from Māori worldviews and philosophies. It seeks to locate evaluation within distinctly Māori frameworks. And evaluation differs from descriptive research in that it provides information about the value of something and usually asks the questions, how well does something work? And many of those other things that Professor Warren talked about earlier. I'd like to share an example now from esteemed evaluation colleagues who work worked with Māori providers in a developmental evaluation of a physical activity program. This example demonstrates the aspirations for self-determining models and the benefits of these models. This is a kaupapa Māori framework developed within a, a program called He Oranga Pautama. Um, it had focus on developing by Māori for Māori sport and leisure programs to support healthy lifestyles. Um, it was across different um, regions in New Zealand and quite a number of different providers. The evaluators involved were Nan Wehipehana, Kataraina Pipi, Kate McKeg, and the project manager was Veronica Thompson, who worked at Sport New Zealand. Three of the four are Māori. The framework was developed over two years iteratively and collaboratively with the Māori providers. It took quite a long time to come to this framework. Um, this model is called Fetūrehua, or STAR, depicts, it depicts a continuum of criteria to, to determine as Māori participation, which is the primary goal of the initiative. You'll see the as Māori in the middle. It was based on the view that Māori want to live as Māori, actively participate as citizens of the world and enjoy a high standard of living and good health. The Whetu covers five aspects of the programme context. There's a, a by, I'm not sure if you can see it there, but the points of the star are by, with, for, in, on, and through. The continuum goes from the outside to the centre in three levels. On the outer edge, it outlines criteria for mainstream initiatives, and in, on the inner centre, it's criteria for as Māori initiatives. So doing things as Māori, what does that mean? This is the the question that they were asking of themselves, and this is what they developed over a couple of years. To further explain um, the five dimensions in the As Māori Centre, um, a fully constructed As Māori program would, one, be governed, managed, and delivered by Māori as opposed to Māori supporting mainstream programs. It would use total language immersion and tikanga, or our cultural protocols. So that's the with aspect. It would target whānau or extended family groups or iwi and hapu, so our tribes and sub-tribes, as opposed to mainstream audiences. And it would include activity being undertaken on marae or in the natural environment, such as lakes, rivers and mountains and it would include traditional physical activities or games as opposed to contemporary sports such as rugby and netball, which is the through aspect of the whetūrehua. This, this framework was used by the different providers, which included Māori and iwi providers and um, Māori staff within mainstream providers to determine where their activities sat and how they might move towards an as Māori approach. It helped determine the internal monitoring activities that providers undertook and when people could see how the evaluation strengthened their programme delivery and their evidence of outcomes, it resulted in a greater commitment to the evaluation process. 
Ultimately, though, and most importantly, it supported the revitalisation of traditional sport and recreation. Uh, for example, Kiorahi, a, a game, a traditional game that was reignited within uh, within New Zealand. Um, it affirmed traditional ways of knowing and being, and it nurtured Māori de development aspirations. Uh, Dr. Bridget Masters Awatere, she's another supervi PhD supervisor of mine, and Professor Linda Nikora, um, they're esteemed Māori scholars from the University of Waikato. They discuss in this paper the importance and criticality for Māori-oriented health programmes to operate and be evaluated from a Māori frame. The background to this discussion is that evaluation practice in New Zealand has been shaped largely by the United States through dissemination and exportation of knowledge, models, frameworks and approaches to other countries, to New Zealand as well. They assert that Western privilege frames continue to marginalise Indigenous people and their aspirations. In this paper, they discuss some positive examples of how Māori evaluators are actually mediating and navigating the different tensions and accountabilities they have, both to funders and to Māori communities, to include perspectives of Māori communities, providers and leaders in evaluations. In a way, they're stuck in the middle between funders and, and um, communities that they are being evaluating. They reflect the cultural nuances and everyday realities of programmes and participants because they are Māori and they can understand the culture. I also can concur with this from my own experience, not only as an evaluator, but also my understanding of many Māori colleagues' work and also as a previous manager within Kaupapa Māori Services. There are evaluation practices that are occurring where Māori evaluators undertake and provide necessary consideration of the context, cultural framing and values of a programme or provider and they understand the cultural nuances and the cultural accountabilities. They use cultural processes and methods to engage. They may also develop specific cultural frameworks or help to unpack the cultural frameworks that are currently embedded within the programme. For example, another colleague um, of mine, an evaluation mentor of mine, Katarina Pipi, recently shared how she uses the philosophies and principles of the programme being evaluated as a framework for underpinning an evaluation. Māori programmes delivered by Māori almost always have a set of principles or values or even complex frameworks that they've developed by which they aim to deliver their programmes. And I'm sure it's the same here, but every programme that we have that is delivered by Māori will always kind of have that, that framework behind them, but it may be different in different contexts and places. For Katarina, these become the PO or the poles which guide the evaluation. They become the filter and the lens by which one looks at the programme and gathers information. It determines what you look at, how you look at it, what you do, how you do it, and how you make sense of it. Sometimes approaches or methods of delivery are less explicit and, and embedded within a programme because it's considered normal to deliver in a particular way and requires unpacking. An evaluator may help to unpack the, the approach the method or philosophy or values that underpin how something is being done. In this way, Māori evaluators, while facing some significant tensions, are seeking to frame evaluations within Māori, iwi and tribal perspectives. This brings us to a discussion of power. A useful framework for thinking about power, consequences and control is this one here put forward by Nan Wehi Pehana, a respected colleague and long-time evaluator in New Zealand. While the terminology is, is not new to kaupapa Māori and Indigenous research, this framework provides a way in which to think about how we locate our evaluation practice within te rangatiratanga or self-determination and aspiration of many Indigenous populations. So in the left bottom quadrant, we have Western imposed research and evaluation, where evaluation is decided by non-Indigenous Western-dominated knowledge spaces, and where evaluation is done to communities. Location, uh, this location is about collecting data from Indigenous groups without involving them in any way, and the decisions about the evaluation or using it, and only meets the objectives of other stakeholders. 
the next step up is evaluation done for communities. This is done with good intentions, but where Western worldviews prevail. The evaluator making decisions about the evaluation without reference to Indigenous values, about what is important or what constitutes credible evidence. Evaluation done with communities involves some community members in the process of evaluation, but non-Indigenous people are in control of the process. And evaluation done by, commu by communities has Indigenous people in control of the process, but are also accommodating Western values and notions of credible evidence. And finally, the, the final one at the top is in evaluation as Indigenous community based on community views on what is valued and what it constitutes credible evidence. It doesn't exclude the Western values or notions of evidence, but only as far as it is seen to be useful. There is, an, there is no automatic or presumed right of participation by non-Indigenous people or approaches, only by invitation. This model indicates that the results are better for everyone if the power and control is increased in Indigenous communities to enact self-determination. Hence, at the top of the quadrant, we have good, good results for funders and community, and at the bottom, we have harm or no change or ineffective or costly to taxpayers and community. This model turns co-design on its head a little by putting control of design firmly in the users or community space and co-designing on invitation only by the community. However, there are two aspects that I think need further discussion here. The first is that as an as-Indigenous approach must recognise the context within which Indigenous peoples currently operate, and particularly that of the effect of historical and co current colonisation processes, which have created significant loss of language, land and culture, and therefore significantly affects their capacity to fully implement an as-Indigenous approach. This is something that I think we struggle with all the time. So we'd like to do there, we'd like to be there, but not necessarily are at this stage. Secondly, there is the question as to whether and how there is space for creating and making solutions together with non-Indigenous dominant groups. In this framework, there is space to work with Indigenous groups to reflect some sort of part partnership approach. This framework would suggest an invitation-only space is key. I'd like to share with you an example of how non-Māori researchers discussed um, how a collaborative partnership worked for them. It was within a cross-cultural evaluation called Learning from the Stories of Ngā Pūnawai o Hokianga, a safe drinking water pilot project. Hepi and her colleagues note that the political dominance of the, of the non-Māori culture at the expense and marginalisation of Māori culture makes it difficult to form an equal partnership and they share how they were able to work as non-Māori within this context. You'll, you'll hear me talk about partnership quite a lot because this is something I'm trying to work out. This evaluation was based in the north of New Zealand where ongoing concerns about the safety of drinking water led the Ministry of Health to fund a project to improve marae drinking water quality. Marae, are, um, if you're unsure, are our collective meeting places where our tribes and sub-tribes or whānau would meet to, for important gatherings like um, celebrations, birthdays, funerals, things like that, or tribal meetings. A local provider was contacted to work in a number of Māori communities, and they also agreed to a partnership with a government entity called the Institute of Environmental Science and Research to conduct a cross-cultural collaborative evaluation of the pilot. The non-Māori evaluators in this paper, they discussed their learning um, in particular, the importance of trust and relationships. This has been talked about today already. Um, they talk about their entry into the community, really being brought in to the community by the tribal researchers, um, and that this was a key part of being guided into the community as external evaluators, as non-Indigenous evaluators. Um, and also by coming to meet tribal leaders on their own turf, trustworthiness, credibility and integrity as people um, shown by their actions was very important in this evaluation, as was the initial relationship with the tribal researchers. So towards the end, they, they learnt that they were accepted, but they didn't know that until towards the end. 
Further to this, they emphasise the necessity for non-Māori researchers to forego the traditional control they have and work within a Māori-controlled context. They discuss the need for the non-Māori researchers to support rather than conduct the evaluation, and that tribal researchers apply tikanga to the research processes or their cultural processes and Māori worldviews to the analysis. They also talk about a tuakana relationship, which is like um, older sister, younger sister, um, older brother, younger brother type of relationship between the non-Māori researchers and the tribal co-researchers. Um, and this meant that when they were in the Māori world, the tribal members guided them. They were the tainā, the younger ones, and they were guided in that context. And sometimes when they had something to share, then they may have become the tuakana. So it's a, um, a fluid kind of role as a tuakana tainā. Lastly, I'd like to turn to a framework developed by an esteemed researcher in education in New Zealand, Professor Angus McFarlane, to reflect on how different paradigms might work to con contribute their various kete of knowledge toward a joint goal. Professor McFarlane called this model a braided rivers approach, or he awa whiria. Braided rivers in New Zealand, and I don't know if you can see the picture, but it's a very flat bed, and often found typical of South Island rivers in the New Zealand, very flat, wide bed of stones and many streams um, weaving across that, those beds. I think this model lends some useful analysis to solutions about working together from different paradigms. As part of a national program looking at evidence-based programs for working with children with conduct disorder, Angus discussed with the National Research Group the need for evidence of effective programs for Māori children and families from a Māori worldview. He also highlighted the need for the evidence of effective adaptions of models brought in from Western science. And Professor Warren was just talking about that similar thing. While it was difficult to find evidence-based programs developed by Māori, they were in fact there when they looked for them. Over the years, there have been a number of programs developed and evaluations undertaken affirming Māori program effectiveness. These are usually not evaluations using randomised controlled trials, but evidence using qualitative research, community feedback and case studies. The Western programs, as depicted on the left slide, side of the slide, provided evidence within other countries such as the United States, but had not been evidenced within Māori communities and needed adapting and evaluating for use within Māori families. Therefore, these programs required Indigenous-led, and in this case, Kaupapa Māori-led evaluation approaches to determine the, effective, the efficacy and value of programs for Māori. While there is a need for Western scientific evidence, there is a hierarchy of evidence which elevates some types of evidence over others. This impacts on the, the perspectives of what credible evidence looks like to various stakeholders and impacts on an indigenous evaluation evidence base where preferred methods are often oral and qualitative and these methods are often seen as less than. The nature of a braided river like the one in the picture here has many streams that weave in and out of each other across a wide flat stream bed. The key point I wish to make here is that sometimes these streams are running separately and in parallel to the other streams, and other times they connect and come together. This element of the braided rivers approach is significant to our understanding of how sometimes our indigenous programs and evaluation work may need to run separately from mainstream programs and evaluation work, and other times they may be joining and integrating. What might this look like in a co-design context? A braided rivers approach helps us to think about the separateness and the together parts of a co-design approach. Who is involved in co-design and when? What is done together and what is done separately? And how might this contribute to positive or negative aspects of co-design? This is a picture of my beautiful daughter, Rawania eating, uh, ready to eat her cockles. Reaching to, returning to the topic of evaluating co-design, I take another look at the whakatauki that I shared at the beginning and the metaphor of collecting cockles in the kete, 
with one at this handle and the other at the other handle, carrying the, the kete. And I asked myself the question, how well do these people work to collect and carry the cockles home? While I've shared some examples of how Māori aspirations for self-determination are critical to Māori evaluation, I've also shared some examples of how non-Māori researchers might respectfully navigate their involvement in evaluation of Māori programs. Both of these core concepts I propose have something to contribute to the understanding of how co-design might work within Māori endeavours. I propose a number of questions from what, which, from a kaupapa Māori theoretical perspective, guides the framing of the research questions around co-design. These are the types of questions which my PhD research project may seek to answer. The first is, how does or can co-design contribute to self-determination? How do partners work together to find solutions and what do the partners have to offer? It will also be important to ask what direction are the partners heading in? So we may ask the question, what are the, the aspirations and goals of the partners and what are the benefits for each? Are they heading in the same direction? And the really sticky question of how partners, how do partners share power, particularly in the context of the background of a treaty partnership as in Aotearoa or New Zealand, but also in the general context of who holds power and who doesn't. And what of the result? Will the cockles be eaten happily together at the end of the journey? These are just a starting point to the many questions we could use when we think about and engage others in co-design and evaluation. Um, and that's all I have to say today, so thank you.